Well, we are very thankful that each of you are here. In just a moment, we're going to go to the lesson. And I'd like to appeal to you to do everything you can to take time to fill out these lessons. Now, tonight, obviously, your lesson isn't done because it's the first night. And uh, I think John mentioned to you a little bit earlier, there are notebooks that are available, and you can inquire a little later about that. But to all of you should at least have a lesson. I know some of our friends around the world have these same lessons translated in a variety of languages. You might be wondering, what's a storical? A storical is sort of a new word that we coined. It's a play on the word story, oracle, and historical. And I'm going to tell you something very important, very profound, right here at the outset of our program. The secret key to unlocking the mysteries of Daniel and Revelation and the prophetic books of Scripture are the stories in the Bible. They're the key. Now, we're going to do this sort of in a seminar format. Tonight, I'm going to give you the answers. But you're going to see them up on the screen. We'd like to encourage you, when we come to an answer, the answers will be in yellow, questions are in white. I want to hear you say the answers along with me. And there's a reason for that. When you see something, you remember a certain percentage. When you see and you hear it, you remember more. When you see and you hear and you say, you remember more. When you see it and you hear it and you say it and you write it, you remember the most. So we're using all of your senses that we possibly can to help you remember the things we're going to present. The nice thing about this seminar is when it's over, you're, you're going to be blown away by the things you learn, I promise you. You then will have the notebook that's filled with these lessons. You can take this information, we hope you do, and share it with, your with all of your friends. Well, at this time, we'd like to go to the screen and begin our presentation. I like to start with an amazing fact. Maybe some of you were wondering, what's amazing facts? That's a question that Karen should have asked tonight. Who's putting this on? What is amazing facts? Amazing facts is a radio, TV ministry, a Christian ministry, a publishing ministry. It's been around for about 36 years now. Started in Frederick, Maryland. We're now based outside of Sacramento, California. We are a self-supporting ministry. We're funded by people who watch us from the radio and the TV programs around the country and around the world. Uh, international ministry. I was just in India 40 days this year. My wife reminds me I was gone 40 days and 40 nights, like Noah's flood. And uh, so one of the things that's interesting about Amazing Facts is it started as a little radio broadcast about 35 years ago where the founder would give an amazing fact from history or science and then tie some spiritual lesson into that. Well, I like to start our programs and incorporate different amazing facts. You know, when I grew up in New York City, the tallest building was the Empire State Building. Right about the time I was leaving, they were forming a great big old hole down there where now stands the World Trade Center. And you realize that they took enough material out of that hole to create another 25 acres of real estate in Battery Park. World Trade Center, of course, is the tallest building in New York City and one of the tallest in the world. It is the largest office space in the world. And as many as 250,000 people either work or visit the building each day. Do you know that's more than half the people that live in the whole state of Wyoming in one building in New York City? Somebody told me there's more people living above the 20th floor in New York City than the whole state of Minnesota. That's an amazing fact. I understand that uh, one man walked on a tightrope from one tower to the next. Others have parachuted off the top and landed in the Hudson River in motorboats and then sped away because you're not supposed to do that. Someone else took these suction cups and went all the way up the side of one of the towers. And I recommend that you take the elevator. Grew up in New York City, but I'd never been to the World Trade Center until this year. Karen and I were so excited, we went three times in one week. I'm one of these people, grew up in New York City, never went inside the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> like, uh, you know, sometimes you cease to appreciate something when it's right in front of you as you're growing up. But New York City is one of the great cities of the world. And it's why we've chosen this international broadcast from this city, because here you have the United Nations, Wall Street, and in many respects it's an international global capital. Are you aware that New York City was the first capital for the United States 
From 1785 to 1790, this was the capital for the United States. Then they moved it to Washington, D.C. Do you know they used enough concrete in the World Trade Center to build a sidewalk five feet wide all the way from New York City to Washington, D.C.? Just a little trivia I thought I'd share with you. But long ago, there was another city even more spectacular than New York City, than Manhattan. And that's going to be the subject of our study tonight. The name of the lesson is The Millennial Man, and you'll understand that more as we proceed. People right now are very apprehensive about the time in which we're living. We're entering a new millennium, and a lot of people have questions about what that might mean. Is there some significance to crossing the year 2000? Why is it that it seems like there's an acceleration of, of uh, natural disasters? Is God trying to tell us something? Is there a prophetic clock that's ticking? Are we running out of time? How can we know what the future holds? Where do we find the answers? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that through the prophecies, we can know the future. You can read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. These are in your lessons, some of them, and also you can see them on the screen. We have, Peter tells us, a more sure word of prophecy. Well, we all know prophecy, yes, that's a prediction of the future. And uh, there's a lot of people who claim to have the ability to predict the future. Where do you go for accurate prophecies? Uh, do we go to the 1-800 numbers? I've got a friend who, uh, his curiosity was killing him, so he called one of these psychic hotlines. First thing they asked him, you know what they asked? Oh, you know, some of you called. <laughs> they said, can we have your credit card, please? And he thought for a moment, and he said, well, you're a prophet. If you can tell me, then I'll tell you what I'm asking. But they hung up on him. They didn't have that much of a gift. You know, my mother did a lot of things. Among the things my mother did, she was into astrology as I was growing up. She even wrote astrological songs for all the different signs of the zodiac. And I asked my mother, she was writing for these papers. I said, Mom, do you believe those things? She said, no, but it pays. And a lot of people turn to look at their lucky stars to find out what the prophecies are. Where do we go to find dependable prophecy? Well, there is a book that has been tested by time, and it's the Bible. It says in the book, in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. In the prophecies of the Bible are revealed the future. The reason the Bible is a bestseller is because the major prophecies of the Bible have all come true. And it's dependable. We're going to look at one of the most outstanding prophecies of the Bible that was of special interest to many of the great minds. Everybody from Isaac Newton to Christopher Columbus studied Daniel chapter 2. Now, the theme of our study tonight is the millennial man. A very bright king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in that dream, he saw this majestic, colossal image. And that image outlined the history of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's day to the end of the world. And that's why it's important for us to study this prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar was a general who had managed to conquer the then civilized world. But, you know, kingdoms rose and kingdoms fall. And, and he wondered, how long will this monarchy last? Babylon, at its zenith, had two of the seven wonders of the world within its walls. The walls of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so, also you've heard about the hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar built for his wife, Semiramis, where he had beautiful trees imported from all over the world. He went to sleep and he had this dream. Evidently, he had a good heart. And God spoke to him with this vivid, three-dimensional vision that outlined the history of the world. And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a picture of what we can expect in the future. Now, before we go to the study, we're going to get a little overview of what that vision was. You can find it in your Bible in Daniel chapter 2. And we will start with the verse, if you have your Bibles there, and those of you at home, I invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, and take note of the animation that you're going to see on the screen. It sort of gives us a visual reference of what to expect in this dream. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. It says, Thou, O king, saw, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of gold, and fine gold. Its breast and arms were silver. 
Its belly and its thighs were of brass, its legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image on the feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now there you've got a visual picture. You've got it on your, in your Bibles of what this dream, what this vision is about. This millennial man made of all these different minerals outlines the history of the world from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the end. So let's go ahead to our lesson now and go to question number one in our lesson. Why did God give the Babylonian king this dream? Now the answer is in the Bible, Daniel chapter 2 verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth... Now you say the yellow answers with me. You see them on your screen and write them in your lesson. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and he's making known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days so this dream reveals the secret about the last days or the latter days it's telling us the future now I want to give you the background a little bit after Nebuchadnezzar woke up with this dream he knew this was not a dream from eating too much camel steak this dream was something that had a tremendous impact on his mind he knew there was a meaning to it he called together all of his wise men and his counselors, the astrologers and the prophets in his kingdom, the psychics. And he said, tell me, I've had a dream and I need to know what it means. And they said, okay, tell us the dream and we'll manufacture, I mean, we'll tell you the interpretation. Well, these uh, so-called wise men were on the king's payroll and they had a habit of conjuring up fanciful prophecies that were usually very flattering for the king to help them get promotions and pay raises. And the king said, you know, I've had this dream and it's beginning already to fail. And if you have a dream, it shocks you, and just a few hours later, it's becoming unclear, the details. And he said, you claim to be prophets. I want to know what the meaning of this dream is. If you're a real prophet, you tell me what the dream is. And then I'll know you can tell me the interpretation. Well, they began to squirm. And they said, well, that's a little unreasonable. I mean, yes, we've got special gifts, but that's asking too much. And the king was aggravated because he was suspicious that these prophets were counterfeits. He said, uh, you can tell me the dream or you're in big trouble. Question number two. When the king's counselors failed to reveal and interpret the dream, what was Nebuchadnezzar's command? Answer. The king commanded to, say it with me, destroy all of the wise men in Babylon. Now we need to pause at this point and back up and give you a little bit of history. You see, a few years earlier, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem. The temple had been burnt, and just a little before he did that, he carried away a number of captives from Jerusalem back to Babylon, where they settled for about 70 years. Among those captives were four young men who were of royal descent. Their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were trained in the Babylonian palace. They were allowed to eat from the royal cafeteria. And they were being groomed to be ambassadors and counselors and ultimately wise men for Nebuchadnezzar. They had been chosen for their brightness. Well, when the king gave the decree that all of the wise men should be destroyed because uh, Daniel and his three friends were so young, they weren't invited at that point. Now let's go to question number three with that background. When Daniel learned about the death decree, what did he ask of the king and what did he tell his friends? The answer, it tells us, Daniel went in and he desired of the king that he would give him time. Why? That he could show the king the interpretation. He said, you haven't invited us, we knew nothing about this, give us a little time. And I think Daniel may have even put a limit on it. Maybe the king said, you've got 24 hours. What did Daniel do after that? You can bet that uh, he and his friends had a very intense prayer meeting. It, it says here, then Daniel went to his house and he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And they asked something specific, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. 
This was something that only God could reveal to them. Suppose that you had to dream my dream tomorrow or you are going to die. That's a lot of pressure. You'd be on your knees, wouldn't you? And that's what happened to them back then. Question number four. When the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel, to whom did he give praise and credit? Now this is very important. This is one of the characteristics of God's prophets. They give the glory and the credit to God. Answer. Daniel said, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. God revealed the secret. He gave him the credit. Question number five. We're moving right along here because we've got a lot of interesting history we're going to cover. What two objects did Daniel say that the king saw in his dream? There were two specific things that were different. What were they? First of all, thou, O king, saw us and behold a what? A great image. This colossal image that was gold and silver and bronze and iron and iron and miry clay was an idol. And you know what the Bible says about idols? It represented the pagan religions of the world. And it represented all the false and the counterfeit methods of truth in the world. Answer to the second part, thou, thou sawest till a, a stone was cut without hands. Now that stone that is cut without hands, there's something supernatural about the stone. We'll find out more about that later. Question number six. What does the head of gold represent? Let's go right now into the interpretation of what these different materials are in the dream. Daniel told the king, thou art this head of gold. Daniel said that King Nebuchadnezzar, and in particular the kingdom of Babylon, that was the head of gold. Babylon was one of the most glorious kingdoms of antiquity. One historian tells us it was 15 miles on each side, making it 60 miles in circumference. That's, uh, you could put all of Manhattan right snugly inside of that. The walls of the city were over 65 feet wide at the bottom and 55 feet wide at the top. And Herodotus says that you could ride four chariots abreast around the city on top of the walls. The river Euphrates ran underneath the city. And that's very interesting. Don't forget that, friends. When you come to Revelation, one of the plagues talks about the Euphrates River drying up. It's very significant that you know that. The Euphrates River irrigated the city. It ran under the walls, through the city, and out the other side. And they used that water, of course, to irrigate the hanging gardens. Not only that, it was a beautiful city. They had glazed blue and gold and purple tiles that mounted the walls and the palaces. And so here, Babylon was symbolized as this head of gold. Number seven, would the kingdom of Babylon last forever? Well, how long did the gold last? It is followed now by another material. No, it says, after thee shall another kingdom arise inferior to thee, just as gold, I'm sorry, silver is inferior to gold. Now, how did Babylon fall? First of all, Nebuchadnezzar did not think that this was going to happen. In their archaeology and their research, they've dug up some tablets and some bricks where Nebuchadnezzar stamped with his own seal and he said that he wanted the kingdom of Babylon to last forever. Babylon, this city, which is the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified, Nebuchadnezzar wrote, may it last forever. But kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall and it was not destined to last forever. Babylon lasted from about 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. There's some details in history so we can know how it fell. As a matter of fact, the book of Daniel tells the history. Daniel was there when Babylon fell. Chapter 5 of Daniel tells about this wild party Nebuchadnezzar's grandson Belshazzar had. Nabadonis, Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar's son, was off fighting battles somewhere else. And his son was all of a sudden in charge of the city. Kind of pronounced himself king in place of his father. While his father was away, they had a wild party. In spite of the fact that the Medo-Persian army had now marched against Babylon, young Belshazzar said, we're not afraid. They'll never get through the walls. One historian tells us they had 20 years worth of grain stored away in their silos. They had water running under the walls. He thought, we've got food, we've got water, we can withstand a siege of 20 years. So they had a wild party. Someone else says the banquet hall of Babylon was a mile long. 
Do you know how long a mile is? They had peacocks pulling little chariots with beverages for the people. All the elite in the kingdom were invited to this massive banquet that King Belshazzar had for all of his lords. And he became very pompous as he drank. And he said, you know, my grandfather conquered the, uh, the people of Judea and he carried away all the sacred vessels from their God and from their temple. Let's bring those sacred vessels, their cups and, and bowls out. Let's pour our wine into it and let's toast our gods because our gods are bigger than the God Jehovah of Israel. And he began to mock the God of heaven and drink to the gods of gold and silver and stone and wood. And as he was mocking God, suddenly a hand appeared and began to write in burning letters on the wall over by a lamp. And you know what, you know what it said? It said, the party's over. That's not exactly what it says, but in essence, that's what it said. That handwriting was written a cryptic message, meaning, meaning, tikkul you farsen. And again, now a young Belshazzar, he calls for all of the, the wise men and the psychics to come, and he dials the hotline, he says, what does this mean? These flaming letters are up there on the wall, and his knees were, were shaking together, the Bible tells us. And they said, we don't know what it means. And he proclaimed that he would give great rewards to anybody who could tell him what it means. He'd make him third ruler in the kingdom. Finally, Daniel is brought in. Now Daniel's an old man. Seventy years have gone by. And Daniel says, I'll tell you what the writing is, but you can keep your rewards because I know what it says, and you will not be in a position to reward anybody. And Daniel gave the translation for these words that were on the wall. You can find it in Daniel 5, verse 25 through 28. Meaning is the, the first statement, Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And then the last part is Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, while this event is taking place in the banquet hall, Cyrus, a brilliant Persian general, diverted the Euphrates River where it runs underneath the walls into a dry, hollow lake bed. And remember we told you the river ran under the walls. Cyrus had a whole army of engineers digging this channel. Then they broke the dam. The water that normally runs under the city walls was diverted off into this dry basin. And his army marched underneath the walls of Babylon. That's why when it says in Revelation, the Euphrates River dries up, it has significance. God had foretold 150 years before Cyrus was born in the book of Isaiah that this was going to happen. And he mentioned Cyrus by his very name. Here it is in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord. Incidentally, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that Isaiah wrote this before Cyrus was born. Thus says the Lord to his anointest to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. You remember I told you that his army then marched in the muddy riverbed under the walls there was an inner gate and the guards in the city were drunk and they'd left the gates unlocked never dreaming that they'd march up the riverbed. Just as God had predicted, the doors had been left open and Babylon fell that night and Belshazzar and all of his cabinet was slain with the exception of one old wise man named Daniel. God's word never fails. A hundred and fifty years before his birth, God gave this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 45. Something else Isaiah prophesied about Babylon, not only would it fall and the Persian kingdom would then take its place, but it would never be rebuilt again. It would never be inhabited again. Here you find it again in the book of Isaiah. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pitch tents there nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls, ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will scamper or play there. Are you aware, you know who this character is, of course. Are you aware that Saddam Hussein promotes himself as a great, 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 great grandson descendant of King Nebuchadnezzar? That's a fact. A quote from Newsweek magazine, Saddam had himself photographed not long ago in a replica of the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, whom Saddam apparently reveres as his hero. 
despite a bout of insanity, and that's in another book of Daniel, which is recounted in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar made his name in history by destroying Jerusalem in 587 BC and driving its inhabitants into 70 years of captivity in the uh, city of Babylon. Saddam Hussein wanted to disprove the Jewish prophecies. He had extensive plans to rebuild ancient Babylon to its former, former glory. Someone even said there were rumblings that he wanted to move the new capital back there and coronate himself as King Nebuchadnezzar II or something. But history intervened with something called Desert Storm, the Persian Gulf War. It drained his treasury. And here you actually have some photographs of his attempt to rebuild the wall. He did succeed in restoring a section of the wall for tourists to look at and one of the gates was restored but he did not thwart the prophecy of God because of the sanctions against them. He has not been able to continue the project according to their plans and here you've got a picture now of the ruins of Babylon. It is still in ruins. God's word does not fall on the ground. What do you say? You can trust it. Man cannot overturn the word of God. It's going to be dependable. The next kingdom that came on the scene that followed Babylon, as you heard, was Medo-Persia. It lasted a little longer than the Babylonian kingdom, 539 to 331 BC. Now the Persian people were a very aggressive and a warlike people. And they were greater in numbers and their armies were larger. Silver was their medium of exchange and they did extensive building, but they never reached the same glory as ancient Babylon, the same way that gold is more precious than silver. Here are some of the ruins of uh, Persepolis, and they had a lot of very beautiful, ornate buildings. This was a palace that Alexander the Great burnt to the ground because his soldiers got drunk one night, and it was considered to be one of the wonders of the world. Silver was their currency. Isn't that interesting? Matter of fact, there at Persepolis, they unearthed a silver goose. You've heard of the goose that laid the golden egg. It's a silver goose that they found. Silver was their medium of exchange, but as I've already hinted, that kingdom would not last forever. It was then replaced by another. Let's go to question number eight in our lessons. What metal would represent the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia? Answer, another third kingdom of brass shall bear rule over all the earth. This bronze kingdom, of course, represented Alexander the Great, and who was he the king of? So it was Macedonia, but we commonly call it the king of Greece. You know, he was raised in a military family. He grew up with his father, Philip, engaged in war almost perpetually. He's considered to be one of the great military geniuses of history. At a very young man, he came to the throne. And everywhere he went, he engaged in incredible tactics and won decisive victories. One historian wrote, I'm persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people then being whither his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over his birth and actions. This is a historian saying some divine hand seemed to be presiding over his birth and his actions. He was revered by his soldiers. As a matter of fact, Alexander towards the end of his life uh, maybe became a little bit too egocentric, made a pilgrimage to the temple of Amun-Ra in Egypt where he was declared to be the son of Ra, hoping to get the same status the pharaohs had as a, as a god in his own right. And then he also set a declaration that he should be revered as a god. And he died before they had a chance to enact it. It's very dangerous when a man puts himself in the place of God. Alexander conquered the world in just a few short years, but he could not conquer his own nature. He had a problem with alcohol. History bears witness. And after a night of heavy drinking, he woke up the next day with a serious fever. Some wonder if it was a combination of alcohol poisoning. You know, they didn't have very pure alcohol back then, or malaria. In his delirium, his wife Roxana said, Who is going to reign in your place? Because his son was still very young. And supposedly his parting words were, The strongest. That's exactly what happened. His generals then began to fight among his, themselves, his four generals, and the kingdom of Greece that did last a couple of hundred years beyond that, was divided in four parts. Greece went from 331 B.C. to about 168 B.C. And that leads us then to the next question in our lesson. Number nine, what metal represents the fourth kingdom? Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. And I want you to say the answers with me here in our Manhattan audience. 
The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Now, what do you think that fourth kingdom was? That was as strong as iron. The kingdom of Rome. Daniel 2.40 tells us, Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. This next kingdom of Rome was the, our next kingdom was the kingdom of Rome. You realize, of course, they were iron swords that the Romans used when they went into Bethlehem to slay the little babies. I, Rome, the iron monarchy, was ruling the world at that time. It was an iron cat of nine tails they laid upon the back of Jesus. Iron nails that went into his hands, an iron spear pierced his side. And you may know that back in uh, biblical times, if you had an iron sword, you could basically chop a bronze sword in two. Some of you who know your Bibles know that King David got a hold of Goliath's sword, which was an iron sword, and David said, there's none like it in the kingdom. Because so many of them back then, and the Greeks were a bronze kingdom, they had bronze swords. They had bronze armor. Iron was considered so much more desirable, and Rome was able to conquer the world by virtue of their iron weapons. Edward Gibbon, the uh, famous historian, said, the images of gold and silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings, they were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Even historians refer to Rome as the iron empire that spread its roads and its tentacles into northern Africa, Spain, England, and they continue to expand. Notice each kingdom is lasting longer than the one before, but did not have the same luster and glory as the one before. Rome went from 168 BC where they defeated Alexander, Alexander the Great at the Battle of Padena, or the Greeks, to the mid-fourth century AD. The reason we can't give you a precise date there is because Rome did not fall in a day. It wasn't built in a day and it didn't fall in a day. Rome sort of disintegrated slowly from within. A matter of fact, a number of historians have discovered that many of the same things that we are struggling with here in North America are the things that precipitated the fall of Rome, which ought to give us here at home a special cause for concern. They had too much idle time, too many possessions, there was a lot of um, illicit behavior, a lack of a breakdown of morals. What would happen after the fall of the Roman Empire? Answer, the kingdom shall be divided as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay. It's a divided kingdom. It's united, but it's not welded together again. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, what came out of the fall of the Roman Empire? Well, gradually, because of their decadence, they began to lose control. Pretty soon, the empire was invaded on all its different fronts. It began to divide from within through all these coups and this activity. The barbarians and the Huns began to attack from the north and the, uh, the German tribes, they were attacked by sea. And little by little, Rome's power was eroded until in the place of the Roman Empire, covering basically the same geography, there was now what we think of as the modern nations of Europe. Well, they had 10 divisions before. How many toes did this uh, beast have, or this image have? This colossal image had 10 toes, and it was divided into 10 kingdoms. Here are the ancient names of those ten divisions. You've got the Suevi and the Visigoths, and the Alamanni, for instance, were the Germans, the Franks were the French, the Burgundians were the Swiss, the Suevi, Portugal, the Lombards, what we commonly call today Italy, the Visigoths, Spain, the Anglo-Saxons were England, and then there are three that fell, and we'll talk more about them in another study. That was the Vandals, you've heard of Vandalism? That's where it comes from the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. But there were ten divisions of the Roman Empire that ended up into the modern states of what we think of now as Germany. Number 11, would these ten kingdoms ever succeed in uniting? No, they would try, but they wouldn't succeed. It says they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. They tried to do it through intermarriage but they will not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. 
several attempts were made to reunite and to forge together that ancient luster that Rome enjoyed. Rome sort of was the pinnacle of world empires when it comes to its expanse. Charlemagne tried, and he was able to gain a great deal of power and prestige, but he could not regain the formal glory because they did not cleave together. Louis XIV also tried. You've probably also heard of Kaiser Wilhelm. You know what the word Kaiser means, those of you who speak German, of course, Kaiser means Caesar. He wanted to be the Caesar again, to unite the kingdom once again that Rome enjoyed. The word Tsar in Russian, it means Caesar. All these great leaders wanted to enjoy the, the prestige that the Caesars had. They called themselves gods as they put their names on the coins back then. Napoleon probably came as close as anybody, a little general, a little corporal. The deliverance, one historian writes, the deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was affected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but by the hand of God. He came so close, and then there at Waterloo, so many things went wrong that it was obvious that it was divine intervention that kept Napoleon, we could all be speaking French today, except he gave some orders that were misunderstood and cannons were misplaced and everything fell apart and they got stuck in the mud and you could see the hand of God say no they will not cleave one to another you realize they tried to do it through marriage a little amazing fact for you Queen Victoria who had nine children she's sort of a housewife she didn't really like the public life very much and she was a wonderful mother but her children and grandchildren intermarried with all the heads of states of Europe in an attempt to create bonds of peace and to weld the power back to England again. At one point she was virtually the grandmother of all the heads of states in Europe. But it did not succeed in uniting them because God had declared they would not cleave one to another. Adolf Hitler had this vision of grandeur that he and Mussolini and it would be able to join together their powers again and establish this thousand-year Reich trying to last even longer than the Roman power and for a while it was one victorious blitzkrieg after another one day there's a story that tells us that uh, one of the secretaries working under Hitler said to the Fuhrer you realize that this is not going to work and he was amazed at her audacity he said, why do you say that? She says, the prophecies in Daniel say that there will never again be a one world government. He said, then we need to change that prophecy. And I understand that he had an attempt engaged to change prophecies of the Bible that uh, went contrary to his personal plans. God said they will not cleave one to another. Now, you might be wondering, doesn't the book of Revelation say that there's going to be a one world government? No. Revelation chapter 13 says, that this beast power compels the whole world to worship. That's not government, that's religion. There is going to be an attempt for one world religion before the end comes, but there never is going to be a one world government. The Bible had declared, they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay, and that's what's been happening. It's not, they've not been able to weld their empire together. Number 12, who will set up the final kingdom? Let's say the answer together. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There is a kingdom coming that will last forever. Now I want you to notice something, friends. We are living at the very end of time. We're living down in what you would call the toes. We're in the toenails of this great image in the scope of history. Everything has happened right on target as God foretold it would. Even the historians who do not believe in God are mystified by this prophecy of Daniel. They say, it, it must have been written much later and then inserted in the Bible because how could this possibly be that this prophet, this dream, could know the history of the world all in one chapter? I want you to notice, what are the feet made out of? It says, the feet are made out of iron mixed with miry clay. Have you ever thought about what our world is made out of today? Our world is made out of the number one building material is concrete. You ever watch people work with concrete? First they take the iron and they put it in the forms. Then they pour in the mush, the concrete. What do you think that would have looked like to an ancient prophet who didn't have a word for concrete? It would have looked very much like miry, which is mushy clay. Iron mixed with mushy clay. 
New York City is called the city of iron and concrete. We are living in the civilization of concrete, which is iron mixed with miry clay. We are living now in the last days. Now there's more, friends. As we look through the scope of this vision, we can find that we're in the very final event. But there are other prophecies that tell us that we're living in the last days. I'd like to jump with you briefly, if you don't mind, to the last book of Daniel. You can read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. This is one of the prophecies that impresses me as much as any in Scripture. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Now, I want to ask you, what is the time period that this last prophecy is dealing with? The time of the, the time of the end. You can talk to me. This is a seminar, okay? It's the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and then it goes on to say knowledge will be increased. People running to and fro. Now, are you aware that there are right now in this auditorium, I won't point them out, but in this auditorium there are people who remember when there was no such thing as an airplane. Some of you might find this hard to believe, but there are people here who remember when there was no such thing as a videotape. No such thing as a uh, television set. Knowledge has increased more than any other time in history and transportation. People are going to and fro. I went from California to Australia in the time that uh, some people sleep. All the way around the world. It used to take months to make that voyage. In one generation, all that has happened. Many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. Now you notice it doesn't say wisdom will increase. Because man has more technology now than he ever has had in his history. But let me ask you, has man learned how to love his fellow man any better than he did 2,000 years ago? No, if anything, we love each other less than we did. The Bible says Jesus declared in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. That's one of the signs of the times. But we can't deny in the time of the end, knowledge will increase and people will go to and fro. The transit, the, the way and the speed... Uh, of things is just phenomenal. Friends, we are living in the very last days of the world's history. Now, I want to make it clear, I am not attaching prophetic significance to the year 2000 when, you know, it says midnight 2000. Uh, incidentally, technically, that is not the end of the millennium. You're all aware of that. Technically, mathematically, I know the news is making a big deal out of it, the end of the millennium is 2001. But, I am making a point that prophetically we are at the end of an age. This dating AD, BC dating method that the world uses today, you can't really tag that up to the Bible. But biblically, our world is coming down to now where we are biblically at 6,000 years of Bible time, which has great significance because the Bible says then there's a thousand year millennial period that follows that 6,000 year period of time. You've read in 2 Peter where it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. We're at that interval right now. This generation, this decade, I believe, is going to witness some catastrophic things. As a matter of fact, I think some of it's already happening. We're seeing incredible things. I want to be careful not to date this program too much because these are going to broadcast on TV later. I understand the stock market fell 200 points today. And a lot of them, there's there earthquakes, uh, and it seems like they're accelerating. And so many things, so many signs are telling us that we're living in the last days. Number 13, and I hope you're writing the answers in your lessons, you who are watching at home and abroad. What does the stone do to the other world kingdoms? Answer, the stone was cut without hands. Incidentally, pardon me, I want to stop. There's only one other time in the Bible when a stone was cut without human hands. The Bible tells us that God hewed two tables of stones from a mountain. Okay? So this is supernatural. This is good. The idol was bad. The stone wins in the end. The rock is Jesus. He's called the rock of ages. The stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And then it goes on to tell us, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. And as you study prophecies, you'll understand a mountain is a kingdom. You know, all over the world. In, in, I thought I'd just mention here because we're in New York City again. I'm a dichotomy. I am a Jewish Protestant who went to Catholic school. So I hope everybody feels comfortable tonight with me speaking to you, okay? My mother was Jewish. I'm currently what you'd call a Protestant. 
I grew up going to Catholic schools, and I want to say for the record, these seminars are very sensitive because we're bringing people together from many different religious persuasions. Some uh, New Age don't believe the Bible. You're all welcome. And I believe that God has His children in many different persuasions. Is that clear? But I need to be honest with you and tell you up front who I am and where I'm coming from. I am going to use the Bible as our textbook in this seminar. We are going to be letting the Bible speak for itself, and that's why we're doing everything we can for you to arrive at these conclusions on your own. I don't want you to walk away from here and say, you know, Pastor Doug said, I want you to say, the Bible says. I want you to get your information from the Bible. It grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. The Jews are praying for the coming kingdom. Protestants and Catholics pray, thy kingdom come. The earthly kingdoms rise and fall, and there's a lot of instability in the world governments. But there is another kingdom coming that's going to last a long time. This colossal image outlines the history of the worlds, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the iron and clay. I'm showing it to you again and again because I want to impress this on your minds. It's one of the most profound prophecies in all of Scripture, indeed the whole world. Let's review quickly. The gold is what kingdom? Babylon, about 600 B.C. to 536. The silver, what kingdom? Medo-Persia. 536 to 331. The bronze is what kingdom? Greece. 331 to 168 BC. Iron is the kingdom of? The iron monarchy of Rome. 168 to about 476 AD. Then the iron and clay are the ten divisions of what we would think of modern Europe now. And they reach from about 476 till when? Till God sets up his kingdom. On the scope of things, friends, I hope that uh, you've got your sunglasses handy because you've got a bright future. There's some very monumental events on the imminent horizon. After hearing Daniel's clear interpretation of the dream, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord? First of all, can you imagine the look on Nebuchadnezzar's face? He asks all of his wise men to tell him what he dreamed. Then Daniel comes in. He relates the king's dream and gives the king's interpretation. Would you like to photograph a little Polaroid of Nebuchadnezzar's expression? at the end of all this. First of all, wouldn't you know that if someone could tell you what you dreamed and you said, yes, it's all coming back to me, that's the dream, that person could also tell you what the interpretation is? I think he had to face something like just total amazement that Daniel told him everything. Now, everything's happened right on schedule, just as he said. What did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord after Daniel related all of these things to him? He said, the king answered Daniel and said, of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. He knew that what Daniel had said was true and that it was going to all come to pass, even though he didn't like the part about his kingdom not lasting forever. He said, the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. I want you to say that with me. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. You know what Nebuchadnezzar said is still true today. Nothing has failed. The words of God have not fallen void to the ground. And you know what Jesus said about his coming? He's not going to print it in the papers in advance. He said, for most of the world, it is going to come as an overwhelming surprise. In such an hour as you think not. The Lord said, like a thief. Now, I don't want to tell you too much about my testimony, but I used to be a thief. I used to break into homes and steal things. You might think, this is crazy. His dad's a billionaire and he's a thief. It's a long story. I'll explain that later. When I stole from people, I never sent an advanced notice that I was coming. It was a surprise. But when I came and left, everybody knew. Some people think the Lord is going to come and leave and life's going to go on uh, like normal. And we're going to find out, I do believe the, the Lord is coming, but I think that after he comes, everybody's going to know. And it is not going to be life according to normal. And there is not going to be a second chance. Now is our time to get ready. If I invited you to come visit me at my house in California, and I gave you directions, and my wife told me, don't give everybody our directions, so I'll make something up. And I said, you take Highway 1 north in California until you come to the Covalo Road turnoff. And there by the Covalo Road turnoff, there's going to be a green flying saucer. 
You turn right there, you go 30 miles, and you'll see the little town of Kovalo. Kovalo is a little one-horse town. They're watching tonight. Hello, friends. Matter of fact, Kovalo is a one-horse town, and the horse has no saddle. It's a small town. That is true. And you go through that town, and you get on the highway out of town, and you head north about 10 miles, and you see a purple gate with a yellow cow made of wood. Now, the gate is not... Uh, the yellow cow made of wood, but there's a yellow cow made of wood and there's a purple gate, okay? And you're supposed to turn left there. You turn left there, you drive for a couple of miles and you cross a stream with pink water running through it. There's a point, stay with me. And then I tell you at the top of the hill, you're going to find one house and it's my house. Okay, so you come to visit. You take Highway 1 North, and you see Kovalo Road and a green flying saucer. Would you feel like you're on the right track? You see that? Yeah. Okay. You turn, you go 30 miles, and you head down, and pretty soon you get into the town of Kovalo, and there's one horse hitched, no saddle. Okay? You feel like you're doing the right thing. You go straight on by that saddleless horse. You head 10 miles up the road, and there you see uh, a yellow gate and a purple cow. You turn left there, you go 10 miles, and you cross that pink stream. Now, after you've gone through all that and everything has happened just as I told you it was going to happen, how many of you would believe at the top of the hill two miles away would be my home? How, would you believe that? Are you aware of what the Lord's done in this prophecy tonight? He has outlined the history of the world. Who would have dreamed that Rome would be ruling the world? They were a couple of little tribes. Who would have dreamed that uh, this young Macedonian general would be ruling the world? Nobody could have predicted that the Medes and the Persians could have conquered that magnificent citadel of Babylon. Daniel in that prophecy gave so many outrageous predictions and they've all happened. And yet much of our world today says, are we supposed to take seriously that that stone, the rock of ages, Jesus is going to return? Well, friends, you've got a lot of sign marks along the way that tell us it's going to happen. If you choose to believe that the last part is not going to fit, that's up to you. Personally, I expect that it's going to happen. Now, I've come with my family across North America. I'm glad to be back visiting New York City. It's fun to come home again. But uh, we've come a long way because I believe the most important thing the world needs to hear is going to be shared with people in this auditorium in the next month. It's the most important thing. It's more it's of eternal significance. I would encourage you, I would plead with you to do everything you can to invite your friends to come. We brought a team from many parts of the world. We've got people here from Africa and China and all over the world who have come to make this event possible. I hope you here will be willing to come. We need you here. There's room for you to bring your friends. Do you have any enemies? Please bring them too. That'll take care of that problem, okay? The Bible says you need to love them as well. We want you to bring all of your friends, all of your en enemies. You at home, invite your friends to the group. We'd like to change the world as a result of what's going to be happening in this auditorium. We're doing everything we can to help you understand what's in the future. And friends, I'm staking my life on what I've been sharing with you. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen very soon. So please, you're here by divine appointment. You had a rendezvous with God. He brought you here. How he did it, I don't know. He wants to use you to bring others. Please. Talk to your friends, talk to your enemies, your family, invite them to come. We still have a few seats left in this auditorium. I believe some of you who are watching at your locations in stadiums and convention centers and community centers and churches and homes around the country, bring your friends to come and to see what's going to happen because we are going to give you the keys to unlock the most important essentials found in the Word of God. On your way out tonight, you're going to receive another lesson. We did this one for you tonight. You've got to do the next one. If you do not have a Bible, you can borrow my Bible. In five days, it becomes your Bible. How many of you will covenant to keep that? Is that fair enough? Giving it to you, no strings attached on the condition that you come. If you don't have a Bible at home, take your Bible with you. And please fill out the lesson. You'll be getting one called Back to Jerusalem. We're going to give you the secret symbols and the keys to understanding prophecy in our next presentation. But before we close, we want to send you with God's benediction. So why don't you stand with me now? We'll ask for the invocation of the Lord on this meeting. You who are around the country, we'd invite you to stand too. Those of you who are watching around the world want to greet you. 
We want us all to join together on an international scale right now and be praying that God is going to do something dynamic, that He's going to do something revolutionary. There's a promise that when we open His Word together, His Word will not return void. I think that this meeting here at this time is of historic significance. There's a lot of things going on right now in Manhattan. A lot of other events, people scurrying about on the streets. But I'll make you a promise. Heaven is intensely focused on what's happening in this auditorium and these respective locations around the world. We need to pray together. Let's bow our heads. Loving Lord, we want to thank you for the gift you've given us in your word. And Father, we would pray that you would pour out your spirit on this meeting. Each of these people who have come tonight, those who are watching on TV and those who are gathered in homes and churches around the country and around the world, you by divine appointment have arranged for them to be where they are. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is tugging at their hearts that they might return. I pray that you will speak and whisper in their ear through the Holy Spirit to bring them back again, that we might learn these things that will change our lives for our eternal good. Lord, we know that the kingdoms of this world will soon be crushed. They'll be pulverized by the rock of ages that will fly from the heavens and they will blow away, never to return. But that rock, that kingdom, will last forever. Lord, we need to learn now how to be citizens of that kingdom. I pray that you'll bless each person here. I know there's a lot of different needs represented. These people, Lord, are struggling like all people in their homes, maybe some with their health, maybe in their families, their finances. Some, Lord, are struggling with uh, their employment, a variety of issues. I pray that as they gather and they open the blessed book, the Bible, that you will bless them. As they come to these meetings, let your light shine into their lives. Do something great in their behalf that they might know that you are here when they come. As we leave, I pray we can leave with your benediction. We ask now for Christ's sake. Amen. God bless you, friends. God bless you to our friends at home. Please come back again. When is our next meeting? Tomorrow night, same time. We look forward to seeing you. Bring your friends, your family, your neighbors. You have some additional handbills that you can pick up and encourage them to come and take your lessons home, fill them out, bring them back with you when you return. Also like to give a special greeting to our international audience and our friends watching on 3ABN and around the world. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.